And so, of course, as the history we just discussed becomes the context of this case, 1854 case, People versus Hall. Now, in 1854, of course, this is very early on. So as I said, 1852, early 1850s, Chinese are now starting to come in large numbers. And so 1854, we know where wherever we're at in this case, it's early in the cycle. And so that's one thing to keep in mind. Years are important for that, for that reason. So we know where we are. This is early on. Remember, Chinese get excluded in 1882. And so this is a very early moment in Chinese American history and a very negative moment for reasons that we'll see. So the background for this case, again, we see they're coming here. They're becoming miners. They're mining for gold. And the background is George Hall. That's his name, so make sure to write him down. George Hall, the white miner, has killed Ling Sing, L-I-N-G, S-I-N-G, Ling Sing. So George Hall, a white miner, has killed Ling Sing, a Chinese miner, over a dispute that occurred there. George Hall gets convicted of the murder on the testimony of three Chinese witnesses. And so he's found guilty of the killing based on the testimony given by three Chinese miners who were with him. This case is, in essence, an appeal to that conviction. Their argument was, the, the defense is George Hall and his defense, their argument was that the testimony of the Chinese people should not have been admitted into the case, into the proceedings. And so that's actually the case. The case is not about the murder itself. It's about the admissibility of the, well, we can just read it right here. The appellant, meaning George Hall, a free white citizen of this state, was convicted of murder upon the testimony of Chinese witnesses. The point involved in this case is the admissibility of such evidence. Should the evidence, the, the evidence, the testimony given by these Chinese witnesses, should it have been admitted? Okay. So, they bring up a couple acts. Remember, California had recently, just a few years earlier, become admitted to the Union, become a state. And so now they have the Constitution and all these different laws and such that come out. That's what these are. Right? So don't, I'm not going to ask about the number 394 section or about that. But it says, you know, provides that no Indian or Negro shall be allowed to testify as a witness in any action or proceeding in which a white person is a party. Then this one, which is more directly what we're going to look at, the 14th section of the Act of April 16, 1850, regulating criminal proceedings provides that, quote, no black or mulatto person or Indian shall be allowed to give evidence in favor of or against a white man. And so you have these statutes that came out just a few years prior. Now remember, in the, in the courts, remember as we know, the courts do not make the laws, the courts interpret the laws. So in this case, they're interpreting these statutes here, right, these sections saying that no black, they're basically, this is basically a interpretation of this in the context of this case. So let's go back, let's get to the next section here, let's move over, and let's see what uh, Mr. Chief Justice Murray has to say about this. He says, the true point at which we are anxious to arrive, oh, I'm sure, uh, is the legal signification of the words black, mulatto, Indian, and white person, and whether the legislature adopted them as generic terms or intended to limit their application to specific types of the human species. In other words, when they said black, mulatto, Indian, were they specific terms? When they, what did the people who wrote that just a few years earlier, what did they have in mind? Were they referencing specifically blacks, mulattoes, and Indians, made, in this case a reference to Native Americans, by Indians, that's what they mean. Or were they generic terms? In other words, just catch-all terms. So they just, when they said that, they were just mentioning just generic groups, basically anyone who's not white. And so that's really what the case is about. It's not about the murder itself. It's not about that. It's about the interpretation of this statute. He was convicted on the testimony of the Chinese witnesses. Should the Chinese witnesses, should their testimony have been admitted? So if these are specific terms, as we can imagine, if they say these are specific terms, obviously it would mean, no, the Chinese can testify against white people because Chinese are not black. Chinese are not mulatto and Chinese are not Indian. They're not a part of these groups. And they make that point a little later also. Um, and so if they are generic terms, that means, of course, that Chinese were meant to be included. It would, these are just, again, catch-all terms made a reference to that. And if they are catch-all terms, it means that native, uh, I'm sorry, Chinese were meant to be included in this group, and therefore they too cannot testify against white people. 
So the question again is only, were only these three specific groups, black, mulatto, Indian, not allowed to testify? Or did they really mean everything? That's the interpretation. That's the interpretation we're looking at here. Did they mean everyone? And so you know, they make a couple little you know, specific points that we can pass over here. And he says here, ultimately, this is, the, uh, this is the ruling. When you get right down to it, here it is. We are of the opinion that the words white, Negro, mulatto, Indian, and black person, wherever they appear in our Constitution and laws, must be taken in their generic sense. And that, even admitting that the uh, Indian of this continent is not of the Mongolian type, that the words black person in the 14th section we looked at earlier must be taken as contradistinguished from white and necessarily excludes all races other than the Caucasian. So in other words, as a result of this case, George Hall walks. He's a free man. Because the testimony of the Chinese witnesses is thus deemed as invalid. And so it's thrown out, and George Hall walks. He becomes a free man as a result. You know, they say here, you know, we've carefully considered, they're basically trying to, you know, they're, they're hedging their bets here. We, we considered all the different possibilities here, and we know no matter how we interpret it, we'll come to the same conclusion. This act was meant to include everybody who's not white. It wasn't just for blacks, mulattoes, Indians. They put those words in there, but it was meant to reference everyone, that any person of color is not allowed to testify against a white person. But of course there's more, as we've seen, like we talked about with Plessy versus Ferguson, there's more. And he's, he too, like Henry Billings Brown, as we discussed earlier, is going to go on and become its own sociologist, and he's going to be providing various rationales, various justifications for this ruling. Why is this acceptable to do? To ultimately say, because what's, what's one result of this case? Our murderer got, got free, right? Someone killed somebody and now they're not, they're able to do whatever they want. And so now we're going to start to see him talk briefly about these rationales, these justifications. Is this guy going home feeling like a bad guy? On the contrary. And that's one aspect we can get out of this case that goes above and beyond the case itself, is that Mr. Chief Justice Murray here, as far as he's concerned, he just did the white people of California a huge favor. He's basically saying, you're welcome right, for what I've done. What I've just done is something great. But why? Because he's saying here, for example, the same rule. Remember, here's why we can't allow them to testify. It's not because we're a bunch of evil people with horns growing out of our heads. But here's why. He says the same rule, which would admit them to testify, would admit them to all the equal rights of citizenship. And we might soon see them at the polls, in the jury box, upon the bench, and in our legislative halls. So he's saying here what you could argue is sort of a slippery slope issue. He's saying, we cannot allow the Chinese to have even this little thing. We cannot allow it, because if we give them an inch, they're going to take a mile. And we've got to stop them right here. Because we remember, to go back up just briefly, why were Chinese not even in this group here? Well, it's 1850, and there were few, too few Chinese Americans that they didn't have, that they were not included. The idea being they would have been included had they been here in larger numbers at that time. And they're saying we can't allow them to testify. Not because we're evil people, but because if we allow them to testify, well then we're gonna see them in our legislative halls and they're gonna be in our jury box and in your daughter's bedroom. Okay, they didn't say the daughter's bedroom part. But that was always there. It's always lurking in between the lines, isn't it? Right? What did one historian call it? The miscegenation issue, as we've talked about. The miscegenation issue was the emotional core of white supremacy. And that was always there, that idea. Right? This is why we can. We've got to stop them right here. They've just started immigrating for a couple of years, and now we have to take our stand. If we allow them to testify, suddenly we're going to see them everywhere else. We've got to stop them right now. And I love how he puts it right here. You know, again, you can kind of feel the, 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 the kind of the feelings they have here. This is not a speculation which exists in the excited and overheated imagination of the patriot and statesman but it is an actual and present danger. And again, think about today. Where do we see, you know, where do we hear words like that? You know, who we consider to be an actual and present danger in our nation today. And to think about how we see so many similar things in history. As, as I said earlier, so much of the wheel just keep turning. It's more of the same. So he's saying here, this is why we can't do it. This is why we can't allow them to testify against white people. 
Because if we do that, they're going to want everything else. They're going to start voting. They're going to start ending up you know, as our, in our government. And we cannot allow that. Well, why can't we allow? What's so bad about allowing Chinese to do these things? Well, here we go. And this will be the last paragraph we look at here. As he says here, speaking of Chinese, the anomalous spectacle of a distinct people living in our community, and always have that in mind, who's our, right? What's being assumed there? Living in our community, recognizing no laws of this state except through necessity, bringing with them their prejudices and national feuds in which they indulge in open violation of law, whose mendacity is proverbial, that's a typo, huh? it means a tendency to lie whose mendacity is proverbial, a race of people whom nature has marked as inferior, and who are incapable of progress or intellectual development beyond a certain point, as their history has shown, differing in language, opinions, color, and physical conformation, between whom and ourselves nature has placed an impassable difference, is now presented, and for them is claimed, not only the right to swear away the life of a citizen, but the further privilege of participating with us in administering the affairs of our government. Well, there's a lot there. I mean, there's a lot going on in this particular passage. Not just the fact that it's actually one sentence. That's a long sentence. Say that all in one breath, I dare you. Uh, think about what he says right here at the end. Before we get to this, we can just go right to what he says here. Not only the right to swear away the life of a, of a citizen. It's almost like saying, do these you know, Chinese immigrants here, do they, do they really think they have the audacity to just march in here, to just waltz into our community and dictate what can and can't be done? Do they really think they have the right to do these things? And he's saying, of course not, right? Absolutely not. You are not even going to get that inch that I referred to earlier, right? That they have the right to swear away a life of a citizen. It's almost like saying, how dare you? You even thought that you, your testimony was going to somehow matter. Did you really think that? And the Chief Justice here is saying, it's not happening. You have no rights here. Right? You're not going to get anything, not even an inch in our society. Right? The further, you think you're also going to get the further privilege of participating with us in our government? And he's like, that's not happening. It's absolutely not happening. But again, why? And it all goes back to the justification. And that's so important as we move forward to be thinking about that. In what ways is this, these kind of opinions these kind of behaviors being justified, these laws, these rules, these rulings, how are they all being justified? And then and we see it right there. It's in this passage that we see it most directly. He's saying Chinese people are clearly inferior. Right? They are clear, you know, they, as we say here, they are incapable. You know, nature, remember the word nature appears twice, right? Race, as far as they were concerned, if it's racial, it's natural. If it's natural, there's nothing we can do to change them. What can we change? Well, they're incapable of progress or intellectual development beyond a certain point. And as I said before, it's funny, we don't really say that about Asian Americans right now. We no longer say that. It's interesting. And on the contrary, we tend to, we tend to say just the opposite, don't we? We tend to view Asian Americans as this model minority who, are, who is extremely bright. And that's one thing we'll look at. What's going on then in the, this is the 1850s, what's going on 100 years later that suddenly the idea is just the opposite. We tend to view Asians as intellectually superior, as evidenced by how many are in college and all that, all these other indicators. So that's one thing we're going to come back to later on this semester, is to ask, is to ask that question. What, what's going on that causes that difference? Right? We tend to view Asians as intellectually superior. Well, that's not what they thought about Chinese back then. And so that's one thing we need to look at, in what ways we know that race is a social construction in human fiction. We've looked at that. Well, that's part of the reason, right? We're going to start to change things. Our stereotypes, our views of these racial groups are necessarily going to change. But this is where we see, right? A race of people, nature has marked them as inferior. They're different from us. Because nature has placed, and I, I like this phrase. This is a good one to write down also, right? An impassable difference. It's also a good way of looking at it, right? It's an impassable difference, no matter what Chinese do. And as we'll see, Asian Americans in general, as we'll see as we move forward, no matter how hard they try, no matter they can sleep in the American flag, they can do the you know, Pledge of Allegiance 20 times a day, it's not going to matter. They're never going to understand our way of life, the American way of life. They're never going to understand our democratic, republican form of government. Because of that, this is why we cannot allow them to participate in any way, including even just testifying against white people 
in, in cases like this. This is why we can't do that. Because those people will never understand our way of life. And that's why this paragraph becomes as important as everything. He's basically, again, providing that justification. And it's that good reminder for us, right? Every system of, of oppression in our history, not just American history, but world history, has been justified. Everything was always, all of this was always justified. Right? You take someone like Adolf Hitler, you just read his own words. As far as he was concerned with what he wanted to do with Jews and other groups, as far as he was concerned, he was doing the world a favor. And he says it himself, if you read his own words. He's like, you will thank me, world. You might be cr critiquing me now, but you will thank me one day for what I'm doing. You're welcome, basically, is what he's saying. And so we know that these things have always been justified, and we can appreciate the ways in which race becomes a powerful tool of justification. Because those people are inferior. Because those people don't understand our way of life. That's why we need to do these things. That's why we need to do, we, have, we cannot allow them to testify. We cannot allow them to, to participate in any way with our form of government. That's why we cannot allow them, as we're going to focus on especially here later on, this is why we cannot allow them to become citizens. This is why we have to do everything it takes to prevent them from becoming citizens and to prevent them from immigrating here. These are the rationales that always come out behind it because they cannot understand. It's not just that they won't, but they won't assimilate with us or that they refuse to, though that argument comes out occasionally. It's that they're not able to. Again, no matter how hard they try. Because it doesn't matter how hard they try, right? It's different, right? Nature plays an impassable difference, and it's impossible for them to hop over to the other side. And so we can appreciate why this particular case is an important early case in Asian American history, why it's so important that we look at this. Because we see it's 1854. Again, it's not so much the exact date, but to know that this is an early moment. Chinese have only been here for a few years in large numbers. And right at the beginning, we see various attempts to curtail their influence, to make sure you know, their rights, they have as few rights as possible. Because as I talked about before, what we have, the last thing I want to look at with this case, before we move on, is the message. Right? It's not just, OK, we have laws that are put out there. We have rulings, and they say what they say. But it's always a reminder of the message that these rulings are sending. We talked about that, for instance, with the Plessy versus Ferguson. Remember Henry Billings Brown? He said what? There's no social message. Jim Crow segregation, there's no social message because everybody's being treated equally. Whites get a car, blacks get a car. Whites can't go in the black car just as much as blacks can't go in the white car. Everybody gets fined. Everybody's being treated evenly. Because of that, there's no discrimination. Everybody, it's all even-handed. There's no message being sent. But as we recall, John Marshall Harlan in his dissent said, on the contrary, everyone knows what the meaning of Jim Crow, the very social meaning of Jim Crow, is to oppress black people. The social meaning is clear. Black people are second-class citizens, and Jim Crow is out there to remind everyone of it everywhere blacks went. They're to be reminded of their inferior status. And Harlan is like, no, the social meaning is clear. So we can do the same thing here. Right? In the same way, what message is this case, this ruling, sending to Chinese people? Well, the rule, as I already mentioned, it, it clearly sends that they have no rights, that they're not going to get any help in the courts, right, in the government. They're made, and, and to put it mildly, they're not welcome. It's very clear. Chinese are given that unambiguous message. Let's make sure Murray is saying between the lines. Let's make sure very clearly that Chinese are not welcome here. And we're going to make sure they feel unwelcome by putting out rulings and laws just like this. But at the same time, we can ask, in what ways, what message is this ruling sending to white people? You can say, on the contrary, it's sending the message that it's open season on Chinese people, and other people of color, obviously, as well, which had already been the case. It's saying that basically the message is sent is, hey, white people, you can do anything you want to Chinese. And that starts to happen. There's many anti-Chinese riots that take place over the next 20, 30 years that we see. And it's basically open season on Chinese people, because, and, and whites are basically told, you can do anything. You can commit any crime against Chinese, and you can do so with impunity, meaning with no fear of punishment. That's what's being said here. Right? This idea that, hey, if, you're not, if Chinese are not allowed to testify, it pretty much gives whites a free pass to do what they will against Chinese. 
And so that's why I think People versus Hall is seen by many scholars in Asian American studies as an important early case. Because we see right at the beginning the negative reception that Chinese were dealt right from the beginning. Not only the, the negative reception, but how that reception, that negativity, became codified into law through rulings just like this and other forms of legislation, which we'll talk about later. And we see right from the beginning the fact that Chinese were not going to be, you know, there might have been little pockets of let's welcome these people here, but by and large it wasn't happening. Right? They weren't going to be welcomed, they were going to face discrimination and, and m many challenges, and a lot of that was going to be part of the law. So, that's our case. People versus home.